He's known to millions as the Papa Bear, and he is revered and admired as the kindly godfather of pro football. You know, if you think, you know, who's the forefather of the National Football League and who got us all started and got us here, you think of George Hallis. What Ford was to automobiles and Rockefeller was to oil, George Hallis was to pro football. We had a meeting in Canton, Ohio on September 17th, 1920 to form the National Football League. There were 11 teams at that time. And in order to join this group, you had to put up $100 for a franchise. I think it's worth a little more than that now. He was the founder of the National Football League. I mean, there were a couple other guys with him, but they persevered, they hung in there. They robbed Peter to pay Paul. They weren't making any money. George had to sell automobiles. He sold real estate. He did everything to keep that football team going. He was his own press agent, his own coach. He played right in. He ran the ballpark, he signed the players, he did his own scouting. George was a one-man gang. We signed Red Grange, the Galloping Ghost. Not only a great attraction uh, as far as the crowd was concerned, but also as a team man. Pro football was suddenly transformed from a sandlot game to a big city spectacle. And the man behind it all was the Papa Bear. Hallis' innovations kept pro football moving forward. He was the first pro coach to hold practice sessions every day, the first to hire a full-time staff, and the first to use films to analyze an opponent. George Hallis was old school, hard-nosed, immigrant mentality. Just keep working, keep your head down, and shut your mouth. The way he was going to run the organization and the discipline that he created within the organization, that things were going to be done one way, Mr. Hallis's way, period. Now you, now you do that, and that, then that arm, you know, it becomes part, you know, right like this, you know. Now that become that damn arm and all that. You couldn't jolt it out of there. I don't give a damn how hard you try. Said the late Vince Lombardi, there is only one man I embrace when we meet, and only one I call coach. Five minutes before the game, here comes a knock on the door, and it's Papa Bear. He says, I'd like to speak to Coach Lombardi. It's very urgent. He said, Vince, I just want you to know you better have your team ready, because we're going to kick your ass. Covering George Hallis uh, was interesting. When the Bears beat the Giants and won their championship. 1963, George Hallis' the last title. The best defense in the league has made the Bears the world champions. Without George Hallis, there is no National Football League. He's one of a kind. For over 60 years, men have been devising ways to advance the football. But perhaps the most spectacular and exciting way is through the forward pass. First of all, the thing that he changed about the game was how to use the pass to create first downs. You don't always have to throw for, you know, 20, 30-yard pass. You look at trying to throw the ball down the field. If it's not there, I'm going to give you places to throw it, and let's just keep the ball moving. This man setting down has got a good chance inside there. But I'd say quarterback, you got any questions about this, just hit one of these two backs along the sideline. They'll set down three yards and a half. They're going to get you eight to ten yards. The West Coast offense is predicated on creating mismatches. We know that this guy will have to cover Roger, which is scary for them. So they're bound to have some other way to try to do it, because Roger's had some great days catching the ball. It was surgical, the way they attacked you. The one consistent was the system and how meticulous it was and how surgical it was. Montana trying to drive him the length of the field here with the game in the balance. There was never a thought Let's go for it all. Go out, get Jerry on a long one. Go four times at Jerry Rice, he'll catch one of them. No, it was execution. There isn't anything really verbal that has to be done. I didn't have to say, men, this is very important. Yeah, I had a game plan. Joe could execute it. Throws over the middle, a five catch for Rice. Rice into the 20. He's down to the 19 for a first down and they believed in what they were doing. So that's the essence of the so-called West Coast offense, is repetition, developing skills, and then under pressure being able to, do, to perform. 39 seconds remaining. Back 
to throw Montana. Stepped up, throws. And the 49ers have won the Super Bowl. They win it on a brilliant drive. Three Super Bowl victories in the 1980s. What really gave us an edge over our opposition was beating the other man to the punch. It's hitting him just before he's ready to hit you. Now, where does that come from? From the sport of boxing, from fighting. When we take that field, that line field, it's just like Marvin Hagler. That's what it's going to be like. We're going to be unloaded on somebody. Beating people to the punch became our mantra. You beat the other man to the punch. Nobody notices it for four or five rounds. Then one guy starts to struggle because he's been beat to the punch by that much. He gets away at the 40, in the foot race, they won't touch him. It's touchdown, 49ers! 58 seconds remaining at the six yard line of the Dallas Cowboys. Everything hangs in the balance now. That was a game that was the fulfillment of three years of hard work of running that play thousands of times in practice. That looks great. That's it. That looks good. It was execution. Next thing we've got, more of a little more of a passing situation is a sprint right option. And we know exactly how to run it. We're gonna call a sprint option. He's gonna break up and break into the corner. Okay, you got it? Dwight will clear. Let's go. Dwight is in here sliding back out. This is great when they're tired. Tired and they're confused. They want to get back to Dallas. This is when you knock their ass off with this one. Montana rolling out the right, looking toward the end zone, throwing under pressure, throws his pass. Caught by Clark! Clark got a touchdown! Clark, Clark has it! It's a touchdown for the 49ers! I think Bill Walsh was way ahead of his time. When you look at around today, there are a lot of offenses that are built around that same system, throwing the ball underneath. When I mean, you look at New England, they pretty much do a lot of the things that you know we were doing all the time. Our system of football sustained itself, and we refined it further and further each year until at some point it might even have been an art form. Great coach and a great man and great person. I wish I had a lot more time with him. He's the number one game changer. The only guy who coached, was a general manager, was a position coach, was an owner. He did everything. See, Al should be number one on your list. I mean, he's, he's one of the founders of the league. The National Football League was a running team first. The AFL was what the NFL is now. It was bombs away, and he led the way. When we came out of the huddle, we weren't looking for first downs. We didn't want to move the chains. We wanted touchdowns. The adage that goes around in professional football, and I hear everyone say it, take what they give you. That all sounds good to everybody, but I always went the other way. We're going to take what we want. And then he became the commissioner of the AFL. He was uh, superb in all facets of the game. He had an IQ of 183. He knew the inner workings from a business standpoint. And so in 1966, the great rivalries continued. And Al comes up with the idea of, OK, let's take the NFL's quarterbacks. We'll, we'll pay them all. We had about four or five quarterbacks all lined up. And it was a preliminary strike. You brought about the merger between the two leagues. People are going to refute that. Let's, say, let's face it, he's the guy that did that. They give credit other places, but he's the one who forced it. And then you saw he was ahead of the game in terms of personnel. He always had big offensive linemen. We went into many of the predominant black schools to take a lot of the players. We called it an untapped reservoir. We wanted to win. We wanted the best players. We weren't interested in who they were or exactly where they came from. We may take a player in who doesn't have good social habits or has been a failure somewhere else, but it's predicated on bringing them into an environment that can inspire in them the will to do great. He understood the scheme, he understood the system, and he had a philosophy of bigger, stronger, faster. And it was well ahead of its time. We do believe that this is a game, psychologically, of intimidation and of fear. Somewhere within the first five to 10 plays of a game, the other team's quarterback must go down, and he must go down hard. 
Any way you could bend the rules and make them work your way, Al would do that. Okay, Oakland, if you're not gonna build me a stadium, I'm going to Los Angeles. I, I totally disagreed with that. That's why he sent me to Buffalo. And then the NFL sues him and he wins. So he did so many things to kind of wake up the NFL. Even giving a young coach, if you look at a John Madden, who I think might have been 31, 32 years of age, an opportunity to be a head coach in the National Football League because he decided that that was the person at that moment in time who could take the reins and make it happen. This was the finest hour in the history of the Oakland Raiders. The Tom Flores, the coaches. Art Shell has won in his Raider debut. He is no longer the first black coach in the NFL. He's just a winning coach right now. I'm so proud to represent this franchise as their head coach, and I look forward to the days ahead with this organization. I wanted to be judged by the best. I felt, you know what, if I can coach under him, I can coach under anyone. The pride and poise, the commitment to excellence, everything he talked about, he lived about it, he brought. He loved football, loved players, and did more for people of any race, any color, any sex than anybody I ever know. He should be real high on that list. He better be or I'll be ticked. We'll go back. The year is 1960. The National Football League was really at a crossroads. They had just lost their commissioner, Burt Bell, who had guided the league since the Second World War. There was a new giant on the scene, television. There was a new league starting. The owners selected a man that was prepared to lead through a new era. And that man was 33-year-old Pete Rozelle. Commissioner Pete Rozelle of, uh, of both wigs, by God. He was certainly the greatest sports commissioner, I would say, in American history of the major sports. Commissioner's job, of course, is very unique. He very consciously introduced socialism to professional football and with the idea of revenue sharing. That was a, a, just a dramatic thing. The balance has to be scouting, management, coaching, and players. That's the way football should be. Should not be predicated just on money. It is probably the most successful extension of socialism in the history of the United States in terms of how it impacted the product and how readily it was accepted by everyone, including people who, if they heard the word socialism, would be absolutely outraged that you were even bringing it up. If he doesn't do that, the league probably exists, but it's, it's different in every way. You've had problems this year, but that goes along with the job. But I'm sure there have been joys over the years. Where do they lie? I guess in seeing the problem solved. The growth of this league is just absolutely remarkable, because I come through the era where football replaces baseball as the number one sport in this country. The most important thing that Commissioner Roselle accomplished was the great marriage of the major television networks and the National Football League. It's gone from millions, hundreds of millions, and now those contracts are worth billions. Here we go, Super Bowl. Let's have a day, Jim. All right. New York Giants first round selection. Quarterback, Phil Simms, Moorhead State. He loved the game, and what he accomplished in the 60s was providing the platform that would allow pro football to grow exponentially in popularity. He helps launch NFL properties, which recognizes that there is this thirst for identification with one's favorite teams. And then he also launches NFL films, which is, as a writer in Vanity Fair said a few years ago, one of the great propaganda machines in the history of American business. But the thing that Roselle still does not get enough credit for is his vision. There was an interview with him in 1969 when you had 26 teams that had just merged, just come together, and he was asked, what is pro football going to look like in the future? And Roselle said, I can see a time when there will be 32 teams in two 16-team conferences, and each one of those conferences would have four four-team divisions. You know, 33 years later, that, that is exactly what the NFL looks like. 
Roselle was ahead of his time, and he had a sense of vision for what pro football could be. Cleveland is overjoyed. The Browns are the champions of the world again. Paul Brown in the history of pro football was one of its greatest innovators. He essentially invented half of the things we even have in football, okay? He helped develop the face mask. I mean, I can't even imagine that you would play football without a face mask, but there was a time. Playbook, assistant coaches, game planning, training methods, strategy, scouting, all the things that Paul Brown did when he was with the Cleveland Browns. I continue to, to do the same things he did um, 60 years ago. In four years in the All-America Conference, they won the championship four times and even went through the 1948 campaign undefeated. Lou Groza has the question, and Coach Paul has the answer. He was a teacher. He really brought the mental aspect of, uh, of succeeding in football, and it was just not a game where two guys were bumping one into one another to see who could knock the other one down. Here is a football team with a textbook. Players insert the mimeograph plays, and many hours are spent in study. He had what is called a messenger guard system. Cleveland coach Paul Brown uses his signal calling shuttle system. One guard would come over to the sideline, get the play from Paul Brown, and then that guard would take that play into the huddle. The Browns leave nothing to chance in calling plays. Blanton Collier and Fritz Heisler observe the game from a vantage point high up in the stands. They relay their information to Weeb Eubank and Paul Brown on the bench phone. People thought he was a madman. He was the first guy that made the suggestion of putting an earpiece inside the helmet so that the quarterback and the coach could communicate. He was getting interference on his signal from a local radio station downtown. Quarterback and chief radio operator George Ratterman tries to get a Cleveland pass on the beam, but New York's Ed Hughes is guarding all frequencies. He was pretty much a dictator and a disciplinarian in a way that I think some of the newer players weren't used to, and they started having some problems. When Art Modell fired Paul Brown, I went and I pulled all the Browns posters down off my bedroom walls and I said, I'm never pulling for the Browns again. And I remember making a poster that said, Paul Brown is still our coach and putting it up on my wall. I was so angry. There are a great number of people in pro football, including myself, who would like to see Paul back with the game. He did so much for it. But when Paul Brown founded the Cincinnati Bengals, I decided, okay, I'll go be a Bengal fan because Paul Brown's got a new team change the game really to make a professional football from I would say the game of football championship after championship the greatest coach in football he was my hero <laughs> <laughs>